The castle in the forest of Akea was a grey, blocky thing, all grown over with climbing roses. They tumbled down into the moat and grew almost as high as the tallest tower. Each year the roses grew out further. Close to the stone of the castle there were only dead brown stems and creepers with old thorns sharp as knives. Fifteen feet away the plants were green and the blossoming roses grew thickly. The climbing roses, living and dead, were a brown skeleton splashed with color that rendered the gray fastness less precise. The trees in the forest of Akea were pressed thickly together, and the forest floor was dark. A century before, it had been a forest only in name. It had been hunting lands, a royal park, home to deer and wild boar, and birds beyond counting. Now the forest was a dense tangle, and the old paths through it were overgrown and forgotten. The fair-haired girl in the high tower slept. All the people in the castle slept. Each of them was fast asleep, excepting only one. The woman's hair was grey, streaked with white, and so sparse her scalp showed. She hobbled angrily through the castle, leaning on her stick, as if she were driven only by hatred, slamming doors, talking to herself as she walked. Up the blooming stairs, and past the blooming cook. And what are you cooking now, huh, great lardars? Nothing in your pots and pans but dust and more dust, and all you ever do is snore. Into the kitchen garden, neatly tended, the old woman picked rampion and rocket. Eighty years before, the palace had held five hundred chickens. The pigeon coop had been home to hundreds of fat white doves. Rabbits had run, white-tailed, across the greenery of the grass square inside the castle walls, while a fish had swum in the moat and the pond, carp and trout and perch. There remained only three chickens. All the sleeping fish had been netted and carried out of the water. There were no more rabbits, no more doves. She had killed her first horse sixty years back, and eaten as much of it as she could before the flesh went rainbow-coloured and the carcass began to stink and crawl with blue flies and maggots. Now she only butchered the larger mammals in midwinter, when nothing rotted, and she could hack and sear frozen chunks of the animal's corpse until the spring thaw. The old woman passed the mother, asleep, with a baby dozing at her breast. She dusted them absently, as she passed, and made certain that the baby's sleepy mouth remained on the nipple. She ate her meal in silence. It was the first great grand city they had come to. The city gates were high and impregnable thick, but they were wide open. The three dwarfs were all for going around it, for they were uncomfortable in cities, distrusted houses and streets as unnatural things, but they followed their queen. Once in the city, the sheer numbers of people made them uncomfortable. They were sleeping riders on sleeping horses, sleeping cabmen up on steel carriages that held sleeping passengers, sleeping children clutching their balls and hoops and the whips for their spinning tops, sleeping flower women at their stores of brown rotten dried flowers, even sleeping fishmongers beside their marble slabs. The slabs were covered with the remains of stinking fish, and they were crawling with maggots. The rustle and movement of the maggots was the only movement and noise the queen and the dwarfs encountered. We should not be here, grumbled the dwarf with the angry brown beard. This road is more direct than any other road we could follow, said the queen. Also, it leads to the bridge. The other roads would force us to ford the river. The queen's temper was equable. 
She went to sleep at night, and she woke in the morning, and the sleeping sickness had not touched her. The maggots' rustlings, and, from time to time, the gentle snores and shifts of the sleepers, were all that they heard as they made their way through the city. And then a small child, asleep on a step, said loudly and clearly, Are you spinning? Can I see? Did you hear that? asked the queen. The tallest dwarf said only, Look, the sleepers are waking. He was wrong. They were not waking. The sleepers were standing, however. They were pushing themselves slowly to their feet and taking hesitant, awkward, sleeping steps. They were sleepwalkers, trailing gauze cobwebs behind them. Always there were cobwebs being spun. How many people, human people I mean, live in a city? asked the smallest dwarf. It varies, said the queen. In our kingdom, no more than twenty, perhaps thirty thousand people. This seems bigger than our cities. I would think fifty thousand people or more. Why? Because, said the dwarf, they appear to all be coming after us. Sleeping people are not fast. They stumble, they stagger, they move like children wading through rivers of treacle, like old people whose feet are weighed down by thick wet mud. The sleepers moved towards the dwarfs and the queen. They were easy for the dwarfs to outrun, easy for the queen to outwalk, and yet, and yet, there were so many of them. Each street they came to was filled with sleepers, cobweb shrouded, eyes tight closed, or eyes open, and rolled back in their heads showing only the whites, all of them shuffling sleepily forwards. The queen turned and ran down an alleyway, and the dwarfs ran with her. This is not honourable, said a dwarf. We should stay and fight. There is no honour, gasped the queen, in fighting an opponent who has no idea that you are even here. No honour in fighting someone who is dreaming of fishing or of gardens or of long-dead lovers. What would they do if they caught us? asked the dwarf beside her. Do you wish to find out? asked the queen. No, admitted the dwarf. They ran and they ran and they did not stop from running until they had left the city by the far gates and had crossed the bridge that spanned the river.